Oh hi, I'm the Heretic. So the Infographics Show, they make content explaining a wide variety of topics, new videos every day. However, when they enter the realm of politics, suddenly they forget how to brain. What am I talking about? Well, if you read the title of this video, you should know already. Hit it! A question that can often be heard coming out of the mouths of frustrated taxpayers is, what has the government ever done for me? Well, let's take a look. If the government provides it, then by definition, nobody besides the special interest who benefits wants it. After all, if people wanted it, then taxation wouldn't be needed since society would pay for it voluntarily. Instead, what happens is special interests selfishly decide they want to have the state steal from society to pay for their pet projects. Public roads are crumbling, inefficient, run at a loss, and there's half a dozen big potholes just outside my house. According to the American Society of Civil Engineers, about 4 million miles of roads are in need of repair, and that would cost at least $2 trillion to fix. To say nothing of how the average American spends 38 hours a year stuck in traffic, costing $1.21 billion annually, and that's just in 2013. I'm sure it's a lot worse today. So yeah, government has public roads, but sucks at maintaining and managing them. Then again, when was the last time you heard about a privately owned parking lot having problems with traffic or potholes? Not often, is it? Free schools? Schools aren't free. They're paid with taxpayer money. Though considering the dismal state of modern education in the US, are we really getting our money's worth? I'll let you parse that out. Government schools nowadays are built on the Prussian model and designed to produce unthinking, barely educated drones obedient to authority through a regimented hierarchical system that tells students what to think about, when to, how to think about it, and for how long, while also standardizing teachers to make them dependent on the state for their jobs. Even if you don't believe me and think our modern government school system is nothing like what I described, riddle me this. Could an educator who gets their job and benefits from the government ever be critical of the government? Not any more than a Walmart employee might criticize Walmart. A police force? I'm just gonna leave this here. Yep. Don't mind me. Nope. <sighs> Libraries? Right, because nobody named Carnegie ever used their vast fortunes to build oodles amounts of libraries around the country. Nope, never gonna happen. And there definitely aren't people who make their living off of explaining difficult concepts to people online. Museums? Museums in the US in general are nonprofits. Yes, they get 24% of their income from government grants, but the other 76%? Private investors, donors, and earned income. They're already tax exempt due to their nonprofit status, but imagine what they could do if they could earn a profit without having to worry about taxes ever. Energy and water supplies? Ask Flint, Michigan how successful the government has been at handling water. As for energy, the government has been an impediment to energy for years. How long have oil drillers been trying to get into Anwar in Alaska? France, Germany, Bulgaria, and Scotland have outright banned natural gas fracking, whereas in the United States, the states of Maryland, Vermont, and New York have also banned it, along with several other localities. Under Barack Obama, the Clean Power Plan was made through imperial decree and set to cost consumers $29 billion a year in electric bills. Let's not also forget the fact that until 2012, no new nuclear reactors were approved for construction since 1978. That's a 34 year difference. Why do you need permission from a coercive monopoly to build a nuclear reactor? I mean, really? So where does the infographics show get off lying to people that energy exists and is taxpayer funded? In 2012, the 1603 program, Payments for Specified Energy Property in Lieu of Tax Credits, gave $26 billion in grants to fund so-called clean energy products. Not agenda-driven at all. Pacific Gas and Electric got over $117 million, while Con Edison got $136 million. Let's call it what it is, a payout 
to big business crony capitalists with stolen money. There's a supply and demand for electricity. People do pay for it voluntarily. We don't need agenda-driven subsidies to get power to our houses. Legal representation? Legal representation after a statist inquisitor accuses them of violating their laws. That's like hitting me in the face with a crowbar and expecting me to be grateful when you give me a box of band-aids. Thanks, but no thanks. You shouldn't have hit me in the first place, asshole. The list goes on and on. But what about the things we don't want crazy politicians spending our cash on? Such as an obscene amount of military armament, empire building, gross clandestine experimentations, inflated salaries for the political elite, ginormous expense accounts for said politicians, and social and privacy manipulation. Now, I agree. These things are absolutely reprehensible for any number of reasons. But it's interesting you say we generally don't want these things, as that implies there's a majority. So the majority doesn't want it, and we can assume that they'll vote against these measures, but they still happen. We still have hundreds of military bases around the world. We'll probably end up going to war in Syria, and the money stolen from the taxpayers will still be the personal slush fund of the priesthood of statism. So clearly, the majority isn't getting their wish. So that can mean one of two things. Either the US is not a democracy, or that democracy is bullcrap. What would happen if a country's people decided to stop paying taxes? Anarchy? Utopia? None of the above? And what happened to countries in the past that resisted taxation? That's what we'll explore today. In this episode of the Infographic Show, what would happen if people stopped paying taxes? I could tell you, based on historical events, what would happen and how it could end both horribly and wonderfully. With no taxes and no politicians and no police force and no courts and no judges, who would uphold these laws? Yeah, here's the first problem. The status inquisitors, holy tribunals, and priesthood of statism? If everyone stops paying taxes, they won't just go, well, no taxes anymore, let's just go home and get real jobs. They'll still be around, and believe me, they'll be doing stuff. Also, you're strawmanning here. Hard. You can have the police, and the courts, and the laws without taxation. In fact, it'll be even better without a government parasite on the back of society to fund their monopolies. Would it even be possible in a modern nation to reach a point where the majority of citizens simply decided to live without taxation and government? Would such a movement be evolution or devolution? Tranquility or chaos? Property is derived from self-ownership. And if the government has a claim to your property, then they have a claim to your labor. And if they own or control your labor, even in part, that makes you their slave. If people are revolting against taxes and government as concepts, that means they understand this. But to answer your question, evolution and tranquility, definitely. How would things shape out? To answer the question, we have to tackle the issue of tax paying like we would any other issue that the government has to respond to. Take same-sex marriage. A motion that is popular enough to gain enough support of the people would radiate massive warning signs to the current status quo. The government ultimately has to respond to the will of the people. Oh boy, you really had to touch that nerve, didn't you? I'm Catholic, so you can probably already guess my position, but let's ignore that for now. Please continue, and don't you dare try setting up a false equivalency. I mean, we all know that you can't compare same-sex marriage and tax revolts as one isn't an existential threat to the state, right? Because that would be sophistry. And with same-sex marriage, it was a general consensus, a majority opinion, that civil partnerships between same-sex couples were not a bad thing despite what some hardcore religious folks believed. Okay, now you're just making stuff up. First off, you're misleading your audience by changing the language. In the same sentence, no less, the issue is same-sex marriage, not civil partnerships. And with same-sex marriage, it was a general consensus, a majority opinion, that civil partnerships, civil partnerships, civil partnerships, civil partnerships. And yes, the language is important. Yes, it is. As for general consensus, if that were true, why did it need to be imposed on us via the Supreme Court? Even if you pay lip service to mob rule, the Supreme Court is as undemocratic as it gets. I guess the government wasn't reacting to any popular general consensus. I mean, it's not like state legislators of the same-sex marriage were being crushed in state after state after state, including in California, 
with Proposition 8, which was added to the state constitution to ban same-sex marriage by popular consensus. The government has to react in a way to sway the people against a motion or support it. With taxes, the government would have to listen to the will of the people and respond accordingly, despite the fact that without taxes, the government would no longer be able to exist. So it's a prickly issue, but if anyone can handle a prickly issue, it's a politician. <laughs> Sorry, I can't. I can't. If anyone can handle a prickly issue, it's a politician. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of insane, utterly divorced from reality lunacy is this? Politicians are literally the last people we should go to to handle anything prickly. Unless it's to shove a cactus up their asses. They aren't rewarded for doing anything right. Therefore, they have no incentive to do things correctly. And they suffer no consequences for screwing up. So they have no incentive to not screw up. Here's the thing about what politicians will do during a tax revolt. George Washington put down a tax revolt in Pennsylvania called the Whiskey Rebellion in 1791 with 13,000 troops, no less. Come on. If their tax livestock started questioning whether or not they should be stolen from by a coercive monopoly, the government would send thugs to stop them. And it'd be brutal. Statists got a state, after all. Tax-resistant citizens would probably be bought off with compromises in some fashion. Groups would be targeted and their needs listened to. Tax breaks would be introduced to soften the blow for the most militant. If the movement stood its ground and reached a majority, the stakes and concessions from the government to the people would become more attractive to those rogue taxpayers. I already explained how taxation is slavery. If they understood this, then the idea of being bought off would be absolutely reprehensible. It'd be like freed black slaves going back into slavery because Massa would cut working hours in the frequency of whippings. Who would even consider that? However, if the movement stood firm, then at some point, the government would have to play dirty before surrendering. Key members of the tax resistance movement would have their bank accounts frozen and their assets seized. They may well be taken into custody on terrorism charges. The president or prime minister would go on national TV pleading with his or her people. Oh, so you admit it? They would block people from their property and arrest people on false charges for the crime of resisting being stolen from. Even by status standards, this is highly illegal. As though the state cares about universal law or consistency. Now you say the government will play dirty, which it would, but you use this frame and speech bubble to make it look like the tax revolters want to play dirty, which they don't. All they want is to not be stolen from. They are the passive party, and the government is the active party that needs to justify taxing these people. What part of that concept is so freaking hard? Also, the president wouldn't be pleading. What happened is the government media complex would run smear campaigns about the tax revolters, portraying them as radical, dangerous, anarchist, right-wing, selfish pricks who just want tax breaks for the rich and hate poor people. Calls would be made to get tough on them, and every instance of violence that breaks out at a tax revolt or a tax protest, even if it's not the revolter's fault, will get endless wall-to-wall -wall coverage on the news as proof of how evil and horrible those super evil right-wing right-wingers of the right-winged right-wing of the right are. We've all seen this song and dance before, come on. Bundles of cash would be printed, and the price of gold would soar. Hey, what do you know? Our first actual insight. Good job, and we're only halfway through the video. Though you glossed over why the price of gold would soar. It would soar because the dollars being printed will essentially make a currency worthless, making commodities more valuable by comparison. But you know what else would become valuable? Cryptocurrency. Goes without saying, there's a lot more to rapid money printing than just gold gaining value. But let's continue. But all this would be most unusual, and really, it isn't likely to happen. In the United States, for example, it's unlikely to happen. Okay, stop right there. Taxes are not a good thing, you totalitarian dick waffle. They're the argument that money that you didn't agree to pay is owed to people for things you didn't want. There's nothing good about it. I know, I'm not addressing the video's arguments. Let's rewind that clip.
But all this would be most unusual, and really, it isn't likely to happen. In the United States, for example, it's unlikely to happen as people know that taxes are required for schools and running water, roads, and other basic human needs. So a society whose people are indoctrinated by the government can't imagine a society without government. Imagine my shock. We've already established that taxes aren't necessary for these things either. People are going to want roads, running water, all the necessities. They don't need taxes to pay for them. If people want it, there will be an economic demand. Economic demand means entrepreneurs will provide a supply. What is so special about roads, or courts, or water, or name any government service that exempts it from the law of supply and demand? And if you're going to appeal to necessity, food is necessary. And when the government tries to provide food, people starve to death. Remind me again why we need a coercive monopoly to impose upon us what they think is best for our society and families. With gun ownership sky high, law and order would become a real concern. A no taxes vote is like a vote for anarchy, and a civilized society has evolved to move away from anarchy, so the movement reaching this point is extremely unlikely. These are two completely different points. Do you want to talk about anarchy or guns? Because widespread gun ownership will ensure people have the means to defend their property without a coercive monopoly. So yes, there will be law and order. Am I just going to need to say, yes, there will be X, every damn clip? The young and the old would be most affected. With no pensions and no public schools, it would fall on society itself to take care of the elderly and educate the young. Oh no, instead of going to a prison-esque institution designed specifically to break the will of the young and mold them into obedient servitors of the state, they'll actually have to <gasps> spend time with and bond with their parents, engage with their community. Don't you see what the problem is? If children aren't forced to attend government indoctrination centers and incentivized to form Lord of the Flies style peer groups due to forced association, they might learn things like that the government is not a good thing, but that's not allowed. As for the elderly, yes, that actually is a problem as people plan their twilight years around being paid with stolen money through pensions or social security. If this really is a problem and enough people agree with you, then I'm sure you'll have no problem convincing people to donate to your nonprofit charity, because that's what you're going to do, right? Charity? You're not expecting us to be generous on your behalf, are you? Are you? Public broadcasting would totally disappear, giving rise to agenda-driven media. Fake news services would flourish even more than they do today. There's an economic demand for unbiased news, one that a coercive monopoly clamps down on. And just look how biased it is. So basically, what you're afraid of happening is already happening except it will be minus PBS and NPR. Nobody's going to miss the government propaganda. I think what you're really afraid of is the rise of alternative viewpoints gaining an audience. I'm sorry, but I'm here to stay. There would be no foreign aid, so international relations would suffer. If you have to pay a woman to have sex with you, she doesn't love you. Healthcare would suffer. How? The economy would spiral into financial chaos. Of course it did. The government remnants trying to print money to make up for the loss of taxpayers. What happens is the dollar becomes worthless, so people begin valuing their assets in and exchanging in cryptocurrency. The transition will be tough, even chaotic, but the economy will stabilize. There will be hard times and we'll all have to sacrifice in some way, but we'll get through it. Crypto will be the new medium of exchange and we'll all be better off for it. Don't think about financial chaos as though it's some permanent feature of statelessness. Law and order might be controlled by mafia-type gangs. That is literally the state. Or perhaps people would settle into small, self-sufficient groups or communes. Figures would no doubt rise up from these splinter movements to claim power. This is the way human society operates, divide and conquer. Sounds more like people are coming together and forming new communities based on voluntary association. How is this a bad thing again? Then there are matters of national security and defense. Other countries would see an opportunity to invade the weakened non-government state and attack and attempt to seize assets and commodities. With no government and no army, resistance would be pretty futile. Non-government state. 
non-government state. Great thinking here, infographics show. Really though, this is baseless fear-mongering. People will form militias to protect their friends, family, and property from foreign invaders. After all, they didn't just overthrow their government and establish voluntarism and absolute property rights just to have, I don't know, Canada come and seize their land. As the state needs to enforce its claim continuously, they'll come across a problem. Planes can't stand on street corners. Battleships can't conduct midnight raids on suspected insurgents. There's always going to be more civilians than invading soldiers. So, especially in the United States, which has more guns than people. As you so pointed out, there are a lot of guns in the United States, so... Why would they even want to anyways? Foreign aggression is frowned upon internationally, and they can probably get more of what they want through trade. If you don't think an armed insurrection could take out an advanced military, I only need to point to the Vietnam War and the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. Let's call it for what it is, though. Fear-mongering. We can't have consistent property rights because a foreign country might invade? That's not an argument. That's called a hostage situation. Keep us in power or the society gets it. But similar events have occurred in history. The French Revolution was founded on the underclasses being sick of the crippling tax commitments, and the early history of the United States was a constant struggle against tax oppression. So perhaps a correction or adjustment in taxation levels is healthy for society to evolve. The only correction or adjustment of taxation levels that's consistent with property rights is zero. We've already established that taxation is not only unethical, but unnecessary. It is the government's job to realize when the public is ready to revolt and adjust their taxation policies accordingly. It is little more than a push and pull situation that has to be monitored by both the people and the people's government. Society finds the medium rate that citizens are prepared to pay in taxes, and within that area, governments operate. The role of government is to go away. Also, the people's government. Can you possibly use any less sophistry? And while we all hate paying taxes, we know we don't have much choice in the matter. So you admit that taxation is involuntary. Great. You're halfway there. Just follow that chain of logic to its only logical conclusion. Say it with me now. Taxation is theft. Yeah, it's a meme, but prove me wrong. The video goes into an advertisement, so we can safely end it here. Thank goodness I was getting a migraine. I mean, what's there that's left to say? The fact that a YouTube channel with 2.2 million subscribers felt the need to put this out there tells me that the statists are scared. Our message is resonating. Even if they don't understand the facts and ethics behind taxation is theft, the idea is planted in their mind. Once voluntarism becomes mainstream, and it will, we'll have millions of people who will already be familiar with the idea. Sounds like a pathway to a peaceful transition from statism to voluntarism. Or at least peaceful enough. Though let's be real, the state is appealing because it's easy. It's so easy to just have the state solve problems for you, that you just pay your taxes against your will and all your problems are out of sight and out of mind. But that's not how reality works. Taxation being a necessity, or even a good, is not an argument that comes from logic. It's an argument from faith, a statement of dogmatism to appeal to the religion of statism and appease their parasitical, evil deity, the government. We can do better. We can come together as a tribe, as a people with common values and interests. We can protect each other, and we can be freer than anyone else in history ever. We never needed the government. We just need to trust each other. Questions? Comments? Critique? Are the statists scared now? Who among your friends and family do you trust to weather the fourth turning with? Like, share, and subscribe to become a heretic today.